Uh, I suppose, uh, as in a way of a personal context, uh, my teaching experience, I've taught at all levels over, over the years, level two, three, four, five, six, into infinity, even, even the level seven, the PDCE. So uh, what I have noticed uh, along the way, I mean, I, did, I was head of citizenship at this institution here, apart from the file college, for about five or six years. And it's a compulsory component of an access to HE programme. Uh, it's brought issues like uh, development of multicultural Britain, uh, Britain's relationship with the European Union, uh, these kinds of themes and issues. And it was very useful for students because they were lacking this, this knowledge, etc., these political, cultural, and social literacies. Um, and it's been taken away now, it's, it's, it's been dissolved. It was like an appendage to the programme, really. It wasn't seen as central and core. I suppose I'm arguing that citizenship should be very central uh, throughout the student's journey, etc. Um, in order to encourage like an awareness of social and environmental issues and, 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 uh, and justice, etc. Uh, I suppose it's, it'll be worthwhile me at this point to kind of break down this title. Um, the, uh, this notion of a critical citizenship study, which I'm still kind of, it's still formative, etc. Uh, it's really kind of, in a sense, um, going beyond the sort of like new labour conceptions of uh, citizenship, which were um, the period of the new labour in power. Uh, that's pretty much what I was handed down uh, in terms of a, a, a curriculum, a syllabus, for teaching citizenship. But I managed to uh, basically convert it into something more radical, something more critical, uh, intent and purpose, okay. Clearly, post compulsory education, uh, there does seem to be this kind of lack uh, in terms of basically kind of like, uh, I find the students, even undergraduate students, they don't, just don't have that uh, knowledge of history and, uh, history and heritage uh, that arguably they, they need. Uh, those wider contexts, they, they don't seem to have those. So I can only think that something's lacking in the secondary sector uh, if they're arriving in the tertiary sector in such a way, okay? So uh, I argue that uh, citizenship is absolutely integral to producing an, an enlightened and active uh, citizenry as such, okay, I can say that. Uh, now the post-Brexit is obviously a kind of like a compulsive, uh, a kind of like a interesting kind of like um, note there. Uh, I'm referring there really to the, uh, the whole debate or referendum around Brexit, uh, but also the aftermath of Brexit as well. We're not really quite sure where we are still, are we, with Brexit? Whether what's going to happen? <laughs> except uh, you know, it's uh, it, we're at some kind of crisis point here, it seems. Okay, in terms of uh, uh, parliamentary democracy, etc., and um, uh, a, a critical juncture really for our society, as I'll go on to argue. Okay, a very critical juncture for our society, um, and for the future of education and society. Okay, um, and the role of educationalists. Okay, so that's a kind of like context then, and key themes of the paper, and uh, I will go through these in turn in sequence really, okay. Uh, it's, on, it's that very need I've just stressed there, for this critical citizenship pedagogy or studies. Uh, also look at the rise of the ideology of the new right in the 1980s and 1990s, I'll do with the paper, uh, and parallels with the current focus education on fundamental British values. I was going to write British values for this, but uh, fundamental British values really, really kind of like... Uh, uh, articulates what's going on there. And it's linked really to the prevent strategy uh, and this kind of like notion of uh, uh, who are risky, risky groups and risky individuals out there, who's at risk, okay? So that links to the next part of my presentation, which is uh, the at risk national identity, um, okay, which is referred to in terms of by the prevent strategy. Then I'll go on to look at a, a very controversial, I suppose, area, this notion of the post industrial working class or, or um, proletariat. Especially in the context of the Brexit, uh, the Brexit vote, Brexit referendum, etc. Um, yeah, as the work of Simon Winlow, quite controversial at the moment uh, in terms of his critique of liberalism, etc. Uh, with some interesting ideas there. In fact, very similar ideas to Stuart Hall. What Stuart Hall was saying in the 1970s uh, in his *Policing the Crisis* about the crisis in capitalism and the response of the uh, powers that be to that crisis. Okay, so very similar ideas. But Winlow is a controversial figure. And I'm not sure if you're aware of him. Okay. Finally, I'm uh, adapting uh, a work from 1935 called uh, Heritage of Our Times by a German philosopher uh, called Ernst Bloch, and I've called it Multi-Heritage of Our Times, okay? And that's the basis uh, for this uh, alternative uh, critical citizenship studies, which I really want to see encouraged and, and built into, uh, uh, you know, into the education system, basically, because really, it's, it's vital, urgent, and necessary, given what's happening uh, and the social divisions that we're facing, okay. Okay, um, so I'll probably read a little bit as I'm going through here, but uh, this gentleman here, it's probably like the horns of many of us who did A-level sociology in the distant past, okay. Uh, Emil Durkheim, Durkheim there, okay. Um, and, a, and a quote there from Durkheim, which I won't read out verbatim. Uh, but basically, 
Uh, he's one of the founding f f fathers of sociology as such, okay, and he did discuss the role and purpose of education, you know, what is the role and purpose of education, uh, and he identified, roughly speaking, two functions of education, a socialisation function, you know, to pass down norms and values, etc., to transmit them, propagate them as such, okay, uh, between generations, but also a function of producing citizens with a shared culture, history, and heritage, um, and those, you know, core similarities or, sh or shared values were seen as essential for the maintenance of social order, social cohesion, uh, social stability, and social solidarity. Uh, that was his key argument, okay? I'm not quite sure if you're aware of Durkheim, but he's, like I say, he's a, one of the founding figures of sociology there. So, now, the breakdown of shared norms and values tends to happen, as Durkheim indicated, at times of you know, rapid social change and radical uh, upheaval uh, as such, okay? At times of great, um, what Giddens calls, ontological insecurity, uh, anime, uh, existential precarity, okay, and we can we're kind of living in those times now in late modernity, really, okay, and also a lack of um, what Necht and Klug, um, two German sociologists, called context of living. People lack context of living. There's a crisis of meaning for people as such, um, a crisis of meaning, identity, and belonging. Um, so it's clear in late modernity we are living through such a period, okay, and uh, you can put it also in the context, I mean, this more in the keynote was uh, said about the same basically about the global capitalist networks and flows, etc., the global financial crisis of 2008, uh, they present a real challenge to these dominant conceptions of, and meanings of society, home, community, the nation, uh, culture, and social belonging. Okay, so there have been various attempts to encourage a sense of civic nationalism as opposed to ethnic nationalism, and New Labour were very much at the, the front of that, okay? And looking back now, I mean, New Labour, New Labour seems like a dream time almost, given the, the onslaught we've been under, okay? I mean, heavens above, it was a, a, a continuation of the neoliberal project, but, uh, but yes, uh, please take us back there. Um, but, ne but never mind. Um, uh, but basically, um, that was an attempt really to, to reclaim uh, national symbols from the political right, really, okay? Who basically infused those symbols with racist, 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 jingoistic, xenophobic meaning as such, okay? Um, so basically, um, and at one point, I think New Labour called for a, very idealistic, for a, a citizenship day that would bring everyone together, okay? With a shared sense of Britishness as such. Um, and I always ask my students all the time, what, the, what on earth is this Britishness? You know, what is this core identity? What are these essential core similarities we're supposed to have here that bring us all together from our different uh, social backgrounds, etc.? Um, so, um, also at the same time, I'd say with New Labour, it wasn't a, a genuine attempt to change the political culture of this country, which met a lot of resistance, okay, and to actively promote those universal liberal values of, free, of freedom, diversity, toleration, and human rights. Now, I argue that's not radical enough. We need to be critiquing capitalism. We need to be critiquing the, uh, uh, the, you know, uh, that's, that's the problem here. And liberalism, liberalism, liberalism and New Labour's conception of citizenship doesn't really touch you know, capitalism, it doesn't really critique that. And that's what we need. We need to get radical, in other words, get to the root of the problems here, okay? Um, okay, so uh, there's old Durkheim there, sailing away. Now, there's two quotes here. I mean, these are, a lot of the, the materials I've used here are actually from the 1930s, and uh, these German-Jewish uh, social philosophers, Max Horkheim and eventually Herbert Marcuse, who made up the first generation of the Frankfurt School, and there's still interesting things to say here. I mean, this, this quote is particularly interesting in the current climate in which we're in. I was not prepared to talk about capitalism, should also remain silent about fascism. And what was he saying, Max Horkheimer, with that? These guys did escape from Nazi Germany, of course. They fled. Uh, um, they'd be something, by the way, on the way down here, back to Monfort University. I mean, back to Monfort, yeah. Yes, uh, they made some solid stuff there. I found that interesting. Do you know the guy in no. Did he not no. expel the Jewish people from, from Leicester? Um, think you very This is on the train. No. Uh, yes, oh, I should say this. Sorry, Mr. Dorn, for where you are now. Um, Turning his grave, if I betrayed him there. But yeah, apparently, yes, there was a Jewish community here, but it was like a very well as a side point there, kind of conserving a little bit. But this is a, a very sort of Marxist, kind of socialist kind of statement. Very familiar from the, uh, the Weimar years in, in Germany before the rise of Nazism and German fascism. Uh, Rosa Luxemburg uh, basically kind of uh, used this statement as well. We're at this critical juncture, really, socialism or barbarism. Uh, um, and it will go either way at this point in time. Okay, we could send into deeper social conflict, social divisions, or we can kind of like you know recuperate the Enlightenment project and kind of make a difference. And that's what, that's what I'm driving for here with this uh, citizenship studies. It's going to go across all different uh, specialisms, all the We need to have this cultural, social, and political awareness. It's what's lacking. Um, 
Okay, uh, so basically, um, anything else to say there, yeah. Um, yeah, um, in the Brexit campaign, its aftermath, uh, what has been revealed really is those deep social divisions, okay. Uh, and even, even talk of a civil war that may last for a generation here, okay. And these, these, these are the stakes, really. And you can see this on social media platforms like you know, Twitter, Facebook. Um, they've offered a space and a platform for expression of hate and prejudice. And I think often enlightened liberals, etc., you know, in their echo chambers, uh, may have thought those kinds of um, sentiments and those kinds of values had become basically historically superseded. Uh, but again, that liberal enlightenment project is under attack, okay? Um, and I think it's one particular philosopher, at Cambridge, I believe, uh, John Gray, who talks about a post liberal society with his alternatives be, being kind of like very much there, okay, even though he doesn't state that. Okay, so uh, that, that's a kind of a more of the contextual stuff there as well. Okay, so now this is a very old book now, 80s and 90s, but I can't help but see parallels between. Um, the ideology of the new right in the 80s and 90s, okay, and its impact on the education system, the marketisation of education, etc. Um, and very much powers with the fundamental British values and the defence strategies, strategies today. So uh, what I really want to say about this in, in my paper, really, is that the new right were engaged in this ideological assault uh, on the post-war liberal and social democratic consensus. And we're all living pretty much in the aftermath, or in the middle of that still. You know, we are still swimming around in this neoliberal climate. This neoliberal juggernaut came along and uh, smashed everything in sight, okay? But that's kind of led to the eventual neoliberal colonisation of further and higher education, which has become so naturalised now. Uh, uh, on the hegemonic battlefield, fought on the terrain of the, of the superstructures, including the education system, um, I talk about the cultural, Marx, cultural Marxist, okay? This is a term used by the new right, the cultural Marxist. Almost like a fifth columnist or an internal enemy as such, okay? This is, of course, during the Cold War, wasn't it? But also the liberal multicult multiculturalist as well. I mean, they were cumulatively constructed as a dangerous internal enemy, uh, seen as hell-bent, as I write, on the undermining the economic and cultural reproduction of capitalist society through the propagation of foreign, alien abstractions that ran contrary to the values, customs and traditions of British, or, or more precisely, English culture and society. Um, and we're still in the shadow of this stuff now, really, in many ways. As I've, I've a couple of quotes coming up in a second that show we're very much uh, thinking this way still, um, in terms of the new right. Anyway, this idea is uh, uh, you know, fifth columnists and Trojan horses. Of course, the emphasis has shifted uh, in recent times, away from the, uh, the Cold War kind of threats, etc., to a new threat, a new cause of insecurities and anxieties. And, and, and this new threat, of course, is the immigrant, the immigrant other as such, okay, or the, the alien other, uh, and the new terrorism, really. And the, the you know uh, Islamic fundamentalism, and, the, and this is a, the new kind of threat that we're fa facing here, okay, uh, allegedly, um, that maybe it, you know it's deemed to require a McCarthyite purge almost, really, in the education system. Um, so it's a threat of Islamic terrorism and radicalisation in institutions. is often linked in discourse to immigration policy and this idea of pathological alien cultures, okay, and that conspiratorial. Uh, consp uh, conspiratorial narrative uh, it applies to Corbyn really Jeremy Corbyn you can see how the, the right wing press uh, have constructed him as an, an enemy of the state almost so okay? he's a dangerous Marxist, an anti-Semite a terrorist sympath sympathiser who's allied with both old and new terrorism okay um, but also uh, you know by the, the right wing media have constructed this uh, but also the conservative politicians like David Cameron, Jacob Rees-Mogg uh, Suella Braverman in recent times, okay. Corbyn is, class Corbyn is classified as a risk, a risk who's fundamentally un British as such, okay, and an imminent danger to national security. Um, so, and I was thinking when I was writing my paper that at a time when Corbyn and his Labour Party are also said to have shrouded in allegations of anti Semitism, okay, the term cultural Marxism, as banded around by these conservative politicians, is itself arguably loaded with anti Semitic connotations and far right associations. Okay, so um, these quotes here, I think, are particularly re you know, resonant and interesting. Okay, this is Chris McGovern, the campaign for real education, a think tank, influential think tank there. And this is going way back to the kind of talk of the 80s and 90s uh, and the, uh, the attack on progressive liberal education lists. Uh, teachers should not be playing the role of fifth columnists. Apparently, that's an allegation made against teachers. So they're actually kind of like this internal enemy as such. And this idea of a hegemonic struggle going on here, okay, this, this ideological war, this, uh, this hegemonic battlefield, really. Um, currently being for our national identity and our national sovereignty. So, uh, I mean, I can't think, you know, I mean, this, this here as well, I mean, I'm not sure what you think about it, but that resonates with, you know, part of this. If one wishes to destroy a nation, that sounds like something straight from the, uh, the, 
Powell playbook there and, and the, the verse of blood speech there in 68, okay, and build a brave new world. The idea that these people are social engineers who are going against some kind of natural conservative order, uh, all these alien ideas, continental ideas really, okay, and multi, you know, uh, abstractions which have nothing to do with the British kind of way of life as such, uh, you know, these, these, these are alien invaders almost, an alien culture. Uh, you give my indoctrinating and brainwashing the children. So this is all very, very contemporary stuff. This is sort of only this last year. Uh, this process of education has started some years ago in our schools, and we are now seeing its consequences in the suppression of free speech on our university campuses. So uh, it's, it harks back to the to the new right stuff of old, um, and you know the, the stuff that was in the, uh, through the Cold War. Um, in some ways, because it's like, in a sense, I would say that it's. Um, I say about this in terms of harking back to it. Um, yeah, no, I think I've summed that up to be quite honest with you. Uh, there's certain terms, I mean, from Levitas's book there, uh, this talk by the new right of totalitarian political correctness. You might remember some, some older uh, ones amongst us here. I remember this term loony leftism, the loony left, okay, and this totalitarian political correctness and literary uh, censoriousness in schools, etc. And Levitas was talking about that, and it's really back on the agenda again, okay, this attack uh, on liberalism. And I would say, while I'm urging to critique capitalism in this new kind of citizenship education, we've still got to defend very much the liberal rights that we've uh, five minutes. Okay, thank you very much. I'm zooming. Okay, great stuff. Um, so, um, all good there. Okay, so, um, and of course, I did go on to talk about uh, this, this uh, notion of political existentialism as such. Uh, this new, new, I put new in inverted commas, this new worldview. Uh, which has been espoused by the media, right-wing media and politicians uh, uh, as we speak. Um, okay, I'm trying to truncate things now and abbreviate things if I can. Um, but basically, kind of like, in a sense, this is a kind of uh, legitimate irrationalism which has been brought to bear. Uh, and it can be seen in the element of the Brexit vote that favours a blind leap into a no-deal, really, uh, with no need for any rational justification or analysis of the possible consequences of such a leap of faith, okay? Um, and it's also, you know... A, a, I say at the same time, it's a huge critique of liberalism and, and uh, liberal values, the values of a liberal democracy, etc., are very much under attack and need defending still. So they have to be defended, absolutely. At, 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 at times, the critique of liberalism from the left is actually kind of undermining liberalism at the same time. At the time, we need to defend these liberal rights, these liberal values. It's essential we defend them, okay, uh, under these imminent threats. Okay, so um, I then go on to speak about, basically, uh, Paul Gilroy and the, um, basically, you know, the... Um, the new racism, the idea of this cultural racism where uh, certain uh, groups are pathologised, okay, as seen as having their cultures seem to be uh, pathological as such, okay, and highly dangerous and deviant and a risk, basically. And you can see that uh, in all the kind of like, uh, you know, the radicalisation uh, agenda, the prevent strategy, etc. Um, and uh, of course, it's kind of, it's increasingly, it's, 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 it's Muslims, it's, it's a post industrial proletariat who are at risk of being converted to, to, to extremism, right wing extremism. It's cultural Marxist and left wing intellectuals are also uh, uh, here as well, okay. They're under attack as well, uh, once again, okay. Um, so the UK government uh, is looking to target the far left, uh, and I noted recently, it's a revised counter extremism strategy A. Uh, the Commission for Countering Extremism, the CCE, has banded large sections of the left in Britain as extremist. It claims the left's revolutionary workers' ideas are associated with increased sympathy for violent extremist tactics. Now, I do genuinely believe that um, any kind of like liberal left-wing kind of uh, some lecturing in a, in a very critical way in universities is likely to be under suspicion and likely to be deemed to be a threat in this current climate, okay? So they're, they're coming after the intellectuals as well here, okay? There's a kind of like a fierce anti-intellectualism going on as well. Um, okay, so um, all these things are kind of like, uh, I do discuss in my paper, okay, which I can fire anyone's way if they wish to read it uh, uh, after today. But uh, all these groups are seen to be um, at, at, at risk as such, okay? Um, okay, so I did go on to talk about the post industrial proletariat. Uh, a group that's often missing uh, and maybe neglected Neglected by, by sociologists and criminologists, my background is criminology uh, primarily, neglected by academics, neglected by the left the, uh, and the right of the political spectrum, the mainstream political spectrum. These people have been left behind, okay? These are people that are experiencing uh, this ontological insecurity, this existential precarity, etc. The loss of uh, crisis of meaning, loss of context of living, okay? Uh, they were the brunt of the global financial crisis, etc. Um, and I do say basically eventually that the road to Brexit, the Cantle report into the 2001 riots, etc., had so much to say 
about the trends and tendencies and trajectories that have led really to Brexit. The warnings were there, the signs were there, okay. Uh, this, this, this mounting resentment and anger uh, from the, uh, uh, I'd say the, 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 the white working class, but it's a multi-ethnic working class. And I think really my alternative education citizenship will be about a multi-ethnic working class, okay, a multi-heritage, multi-ethnic working class. Uh, to celebrate working class culture, because working class people uh, being duped and hoodwinked and befogged by the likes of Nigel Farage, etc., and Boris Johnson, etc., Farage there. Um, and you think, well, you know, if you, if you understand your traditions, your customs, your heritage, and learn to kind of like really, um, you know, celebrate, uh, it would bring people together uh, in, in a community as such, okay, but that's missing from the working class. They have this like, this, this void almost of this vacuum and lack of context of living. And of course, these processes of digitalization and global uh, restructuring of capitalism have left people behind. It's been a very uneven development. It's left people behind, okay? At least, at sense, where they are, are victims of the neoliberal European project, really, which is, is insufficient. Even though I'll still argue that stay in Europe, it's insufficient. I'm not a Brexit person, be careful. But basically, yeah. Um, so, all this, this, this group have been left behind somewhat. And rather than deem them to be irrational, and uh, if you know, uh, like liberals may often deem them to be irrational, maybe we need to sort of understand where they're coming from. What are their concrete experiences in their communities, etc.? And how can we kind of like almost like re-educate these people or get them to like, really understand their own heritage and other people's heritage and traditions and have this multi-heritage, multi-ethnic uh, education, really, uh, citizenship. Okay, and that's pretty much what I was aiming for with this uh, final thing. I'll work miracles to you through this. But uh, there's a book there. So often it's like, you will hear people, basically. I mean, uh, who were absolutely kind of dumbfounded by uh, this ignorance. And the, this working class had been scapegoated. I mean, there was a squeeze middle that voted Brexit as well. I mean, everyone thinks it's just a racist, xenophobic working class, but the middle class as well, many of them voted, uh, voted Brexit, okay? But uh, yeah, well, that's, that's what I'm arguing for there, really. Basically, we need to be critiquing capitalism at the same time as upholding and defending, uh, you know, liberal rights, values, etc. Uh, and we do stand at that critical juncture now, a real kind of rubicon here, is socialism or barbarism? You know, we really, these, these are the stakes, and it's just, we're in a serious bad place, I'm a swore there, we're in a bad place, okay, and I think we're all aware of that, okay. Uh, and so, you know, I've, I've, I've developed this in my paper, uh, notions of this, and, and hopefully I'll get this off the ground before too long, and uh, roll it out across the nation, and then we can have an enlightened citizenry, a citizenry an active citizenry, that build a better future. Uh, rather than this current climate of uh, destruction. And I think the final thing I'd like to say, if I'm allowed here, okay, um, post-Brexit, uh, the need for a critical uh, citizenship pedagogy has arguably never been so vital, urgent and necessary. It might assist in developing enlightened communities of interest and practice, engaged in mature, autonomous and active social learning. In an increasingly uncertain, unpredictable and precarious globalising world, it would offer individuals and communities resources for building solidarity and respecting difference. The final sentence, the alternative may be a descent into a new dark age and cultural apocalypse where reason is eclipsed by ethnic nationalism, xenophobia, social barbarism and hate. Um, the alternative would to look to uphold political and social liberalism while also addressing the underlying socio-economic causes. For whoever is not prepared to talk about capitalism, should also remain silent about fascism.